the first time I heard someone utter to me, you're going to be a pastor, it didn't come from my mom or my dad or any blood relative for that fact. It wasn't even uttered by my pastor at the time. Where it happened was not at home or at school, uh, which would have been curious if it had happened at school because it was attending an all-girls Catholic high school at the time, but that's besides the point. The first time I heard these words happened to be by a lay member at Thousand Oaks United Methodist Church in Southern California. This occurred when the pastor, who liked to preach in the style of the three-point sermon, if you remember this type of style, back, I'm going to say the 80s and 90s, and I would be an acolyte sitting up there, and I would be in my acolyte robes, and I would love when he would get to the place, he'd be like, and in conclusion... It's almost over. So when fellow lay people told me, hey, you're going to be a pastor someday, I thought, oh, God, no. (laughs) It was in the church where I was formed in my faith. But I want to just remind you, because I think sometimes we think about church in a very traditional way, especially the way I was raised. Children went to Sunday school, you went through fifth grade, then you went to youth group from 6th to 12th, and uh, for us... Um, you would go to Sunday school in the morning, go to church, and then come back later that night for youth group. And um, I want to remind us, and I'm reminding myself this morning, that my faith formation didn't just happen in Sunday school or in Bible study uh, uh, or Sunday school for youth group. My faith formation happened in worship when I was an acolyte and I got to carry in uh, the light of Christ. Or we had a, a big church where we would process in with the choir, with the robes. And so uh, you would carry the cross and, or sometimes the Bible, whatever you got that week. My faith also was formed at youth group meetings, hanging out with other youth and talking to them and hanging out with them. Um, But it also, we would go to Sierra Service Project every summer, and that was a great influence on my faith. But that wasn't the biggest influence. The biggest influence on my faith formation, I will want to tell you, because I think we lose sight of this, was because of the relationships I had with the adults in the church. And I'm not just talking about adults. I really want you to hear this. It was the older adults that formed me and my faith. Did you hear that? The older adults. So when you look at me and say, I I don't want to work with kids. I have nothing. I don't know how to relate to. I'm going to tell you tough because you have a huge influence to work in young people's lives. You are a valuable asset. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for the older adults in my church community. Here's the reality. I grew up in Southern California. Most of my relatives were in Chicago, Ohio, or Florida, and Indiana. So I didn't have immediate family around to nurture me um, and care for me in that way. So my church became my extended family. And when you're a young person and you're not getting along with your parents that week, it is such a reprieve to go to someone who loves you and cares about and you're like, ah, sanctuary. You're not just the irritable teenager who back talks to her parents all the time. Instead, you're seen as someone who is cared and loved for. Through these relationships I learned, since I was born and I was raised in that church, that church, I found out, loved me and accepted me for who I was. To be known. Isn't that an incredible feeling? To really be known, to be seen, to be valued. And these were not the blood relatives. These were my church family. And because of the community that they created, I felt safe to explore my faith wrestle with hard questions, which I'm sure they didn't totally appreciate day in and day out, but they created a space where I could doubt one minute and be absolutely certain the next. Remember, I was a teenager. I knew everything. Now, relationships amongst the generations, I don't want to paint a rosy picture that everything was perfect and we always got it right. The youth group often sat um, in a certain area together, and we would be criticized after worship for passing too many notes. Did you ever do that when you were a youth in church? So we would be told by the older adults, hey, the youth are, are making too much noise, they're too distracting. We also would get in trouble when we would try to rush out of our uh, acolyte robes so we could get to the donut table before anybody got the good donuts. 
But here's the thing. I think we forget that church is not meant to be a place of, we, we think that church is not meant to be a place of conflict. But that would be such a fallacy because community uh, and relationships, it's natural to have conflict. And so while sometimes the youth in our church felt that we were being misunderstood and uh, judged by the older generation, I think the same thing happened uh, vice versa. But now as I look back on those conflicts, I realize that those two were teachable moments. Those two were moments where we were forming each other in the faith, helping each other to understand the difference of generations. Now, last week, we talked about the first goal with the strategic plan. But before I even got started last week, I wanted us to lay the framework that even though many of us would like to predict the future and be in control of it, we know that we can't do that, even though we try every day we wake up. But the reality is, when we accept that we're not in control, that we can't make it all certain and guaranteed, we can trust that God is certain. Now, during my teenage years, when I thought I knew everything, this is what I realize now. I didn't know that God was at work through the adults in my life, preparing me, forming me for the moment when I would say yes to this call to ministry. I didn't know that. I had no idea that the church was meant to be the place where they would spot God's purpose in my life and in my fellow youth as well. So much to my chagrin, when they were 100% about, uh, correct about what God's purpose was in my life, um, I didn't immediately listen to them, as I had to figure this out for myself. But when I was ready to answer the call, it was because of the adults in my life who loved me, cared for me, and encouraged me, and saw things in me that I couldn't even see yet see in myself, that that was how I was able to say yes to this call. This is what's so powerful about the church, and I think we forget it at times. The church community is a fertile ground for people to discover their God-given purpose, and it doesn't just have to be a call to ministry, because what happens when we are in relationship amongst the generations, we can now spot within each other how God, what we see that God is doing in their life. And it doesn't just have to be an older adult to a younger child. We can do this uh, uh, unilaterally. We can do this just together in community. So this is what can happen in what Jesus says and calls today's text, my father's house. When a community of faith is clear about how they can support younger generations in discovering and living out their faith. This is why so many dream cards came back to the core leadership team in 2018, in December of 2018, that said, we miss seeing the young children and the young families in our church. So many said this. Why? Because you value them. And just if we were missing any other generational age group, we would be missing them as well. For we know that a church is not vital when any any spot of the generations is missing. And so that's why we are committed to uh, fulfilling God's dream for our church, to build a community of faith for generations to come, where children and young families can develop lifelong discipleship. Because like for my life, we can see it as a way of forming them for how they're going to live out their purpose as they become uh, adults. It's so powerful But we know that this is not just for this age group. When we put this out, I already got some comments. You don't care about older adults. Let me just let you know. I care absolutely about the older adults. And that's why I want to speak to you personally today and my story, because I wouldn't be here today without the older adults. But here's the good news, that I think sometimes when we say we're focusing on the younger generations and trying to grow in um, in that area, is that when a church grows younger, Everyone benefits. I want you to just think for a moment when you've seen the the youth group, maybe you were here a couple weeks ago when they did the Sarah Service Project, how life-giving was that to you? Or when we have a Christmas pageant and the youth and the children put it on, how life-giving is that to you? I will tell you right now our highest attendance is when we have the youth or the children up here in worship. Why? Because it is life-giving to the whole community. 
And it's not just like they're on show, but we care so deeply and we show up for them because we love and care for them. They, um, so um, Lois Pring, Pam Robison, and Michelle Wagenhaus and I are reading this book called Grow Younger. We know this is a gap in our church. It's not, it's not a secret. So we said, okay, we're going to be diligent and we're going to read and try to grow in this area. And so the book, this was so interesting. They said, when we bridge the generation gap, everyone grows young. Cross-generational discipleship is not beneficial only for young people, but also for older generations who need the vitality of the young to inspire their faith just as much, just as much as the young need wise elders to ground theirs. Faith, after all, is not passed down, it's passed around. Hear that well. When we bridge the generation gap, everyone grows young. Everyone benefits. It's a mutuality because that's what community is about. It's not um, a zero-sum game, but everyone, I don't know if I use that term right, um, it is everyone benefits mutually from this. Now, when we look at our text this morning, the temple was vitally important, too, for Jesus as he was formed in the faith, and it prepared him as well to answer God's call and purpose in his life. In Luke's gospel, if we start at the beginning, uh, Jesus is carried to the temple when he's eight days old because Mary and Joseph are Jewish, and they uphold the traditions of the Jewish faith. What happens at eight days uh, old for a young uh, a baby boy who's Jewish? He's circumcised. Then, um, less than a month later, Jesus is carried back into the temple for the presentation of the Lord. Again, his parents are fulfilling the traditional Jewish religious rites um, that are uh, so fundamental for uh, a young Jewish boy to be raised in the faith. And so, at the age of 12, Jesus returns to the temple walking on his own accord alongside his parents for one of the three annual pilgrimage festivals described in Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, of the Old Testament. Like before, the temple turns out to be the place where others see something in him that his parents do not. For when Jesus uh, was carried into the temple when he was just less than a month old for the presentation of the Lord, they encounter Simeon and Anna, who say, this is is destiny's child. This is the Lord's child that we have been waiting for. And Mary and Joseph are like, how do you know? And so they are amazed and astonished that here are these other people, members of the temple who can see in him, even though he's still an infant, what God is doing in his life. And so we know too, as his ministry continues later on in his public ministry, that Jesus will come back to the temple as an adult, drawing both followers and critics for his teachings. So for the Gospel of Luke, the temple really is Jesus' home. It's his father's house where he finds purpose and the people can spot it in him. When Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, finally find him after three days of looking for him amongst the pilgrims traveling back to Nazareth, they find him where? In the temple. Jesus is sitting among the teachers. He's 12, right? So remind, remember, 12. Sitting amongst the teachers, listening to them and asking questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Just I want to pause there for a second. I know many of you have grandchildren or have hung out with uh, younger generations. How often does this happen to you as well when you sit amongst them? And they amaze you. How old are you again? Right? We, we keep being amazed, and that is the incredible blessing. So even when his parents find him, we are told that they too were astonished at what he was doing and where he was. Now, he's a little chippy here when he says to his mom, uh, after she asks the child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you with great anxiety. Now, Mary's response is um, totally normal as any parent who has lost their child and is looking for them frantically. Again, Jesus is a little chippy when he says, why are you searching for me? Don't you know that I would be in my father's house? But what's different this time for him being in the temple is that Jesus claims his special relationship with God and the purpose he was called to. Up until this point, right, the two other two stories we know of him going to the temple, he was carried His parents did the circumcision on his behalf. They presented him to the Lord on his behalf. But they chose it. 
Here Jesus, at age 12, is choosing it for him. The church has a similar act in young people's lives, and it's called the rite of confirmation. For many children who are baptized as infants, again, they are carried into the sanctuary, blessed with the water of uh, holy baptism, but it is a choice by their parents. But the rite of confirmation is a space where they, too, like Jesus, can choose this relationship and claim this relationship with God. Even when our young people claim the faith for themselves, does that mean they have no need of anyone else and the adults in the community to continue to form them in their faith? Absolutely not. Have you ever wondered, think about this for a second, Jesus is left for three days by himself in the temple. Who fed the 12-year-old boy? And any of you who have had boys or can even imagine uh, having a boy, uh, you know their 12-year-old appetites? It could be a little hard, right? So what happened? Where did he stay? Who made sure he was safe? Now, we could say, well, maybe God was watching over him for those three days and providing for what he needed. Or maybe more realistic is that God was working through the temple community those three days. As someone invited him into their home, made sure he had a place to sleep, had some food for his very hungry stomach, and made sure he had a place at the table. It's the community together that comes together to take care of our kids. It's not just left to the parents alone. It takes a whole community. For thousands of years, the church has been the place to do the same for children and adolescents. And I want to tell you that they're looking for a place where they'll be accepted for who they are, all of themselves, and know that they have a place at the table where they belong. I know that sometimes when we talk about growing younger, it makes us get a little overwhelmed. And sometimes it feels so hard, and we think it's uh, impossible to grow younger as a congregation. But as we may, our first reaction may be to be overwhelmed or be fearful that we can't do it, I want you to remember that building relationships with younger generations takes time. They're, they're wondering, can, you, can they trust you? Are you really going to say what you're, you're doing, and are you going to be faithful to the promises you're making? Will you be there when, they, when you offer to be there, or will you just give up after time? The truth is, to grow younger as a church will take a lot of time. We can't just plan three events, have a VBS, have a Sunday school, and voila, we're done. The times have changed. The times have changed since I was a kid. Yes, I long for those moments where we have full Sunday schools like we used to, but knowing the lives of our parents and young families and children and all of the demands that are going on them, we have to have compassion. It doesn't work. So instead of asking them to fit into uh, our boxes of what we know what, what for faith formation looks like, we have to adapt and we have to change and we have to meet them where they are at. That's hard. It's hard, but it's worth it. Because God has a dream for us as a church to build a community of faith for generations to come where children and young families can develop lifelong discipleship. Just because they can't make a Sunday school, every Sunday, Sunday school class every Sunday doesn't mean that we give up and say, well, that's it. That's all we have to offer. Because the truth is, the most that we have to offer is our relationships. Again, in the book Grow Younger, they talk about what is most important for children and young families and youth. And it's an asset we already have as a congregation. It says that to grow in this area, a church has to be warm. How many of you would say our church is a warm place to be? You could raise your hand a little higher with some pride. <laughs> That's what I hear every time that uh, someone new comes or uh, the generations that have been here for years, they go, our church is just so warm and welcoming. Hey, we have something going for us. Because here's what they want. They, want. they don't want the, uh, the lights and the glam and the entertainment. They want to know, are you going to be a safe space? Are you going to be warm? Are you going to be welcoming? Are you going to be accepting? Are you going to help them create places of belonging? Are you going to be authentic, hospitable, and caring? 
Because what's important about these practices is that they create space for people to be together and nurture relationships. Here's what's also interesting is what they said. It is going to be relationships first, then formation. I know I just said it this way. Okay, so relationships are then formation. But think about that in your own life. If I just walked up to our youth and be like, I'd like to form you in the faith, they'd be like, okay, uh, not coming back. But if I'm curious about their life and I show up fully in their life, that creates now space for dialogue, conversation. We're watching it now with our confirmation classes. They're partnered up with uh, mentors. Um, and it's amazing the questions that they ask. But do they ask them in the big group around with everyone around the table? No. But if you're a safe adult that I can trust and talk to, I can say, I, I don't understand the Holy Spirit. I don't understand suffering. I'm not sure about heaven. But if we don't have those relationships, we're never going to get there next. So we as a church are going to work together to find ways to bridge the gap amongst the generations. And I just want to be uh, honest. I can't be that bridge for you. What do I mean? You can't say to me what's going on with one of our youth's lives and then me report back to you, this is what's going on. I need you to talk to them. Don't let me be the pass between. And if I find myself, because I like to be the pass between sometimes, just say, oh, so sorry, I'm going to go talk to them directly. Or if you want to know their names, I'll help you bridge those relationships. But I can't be the one just reporting to you what's going on in their lives. It's your opportunity. It's a huge blessing to get to know them. Does that mean maybe sometimes you don't come to the 8.30 service and you come to the 10 o'clock? Maybe that means sometimes that you say, hey, I want to help out with the youth group. You have to go to them. Waiting for them to come to you, we will be waiting a long, long time. And it doesn't mean that they don't care. But they're youth that are longing to be seen to be reached, to be loved, to be touched, to know that they matter. It's vulnerable to be in relationship. I don't, and I, I'm not here to say I get it right 100% with the youth group because it's, it's hard to talk to you. I'm looking at Kim because she's like, yes, I know. <laughs> but again, like I said, um, it's so helpful when you get to know someone, a youth, and see what they're going through these days. It's very challenging. It's very challenging. It's not like what we had but to then accept them. So um, the group grow, the group, a book group, Grow Younger, came up with this idea, which I'm so excited about because it wasn't mine. And I was like, well, how did I miss this? So um, they had come to worship when the youth group had shared about Sierra Service Project. And we we're talking about ways, how do we bridge the generational gap? And so they said, hey, I, can they teach us those card games they were talking about at, uh, that they played at Sierra Service Project? Um, and so I want to invite you. So God is at work. I'm telling you, God is doing something in our midst because we had planned for next week that the youth were just going to bring their favorite card games, board games, whatever, and we would just play games. But then we got thinking, well, why don't we just have food for everybody and then have tables set aside where the youth can teach the adults, myself included, these new games. Here's an opportunity to show up. Here's an opportunity to bridge the gap. Now, I know sometimes when we play games, we get really frustrated, and I know we lose our patience quickly, so maybe when we come, we bring our patience, we have to listen, and let them guide us. And again, maybe that's a way for us to practice giving up control. And maybe we might actually discover some really exciting and fun things about one another. Because again, when we make the effort towards them, we not only benefit and they are not only one benefiting too. It's a huge blessing when you get to watch a youth grow up in the faith and see where God takes them and to be able to identify that within them. They're hungry. They want to know what you see. This is such an exciting time for our church. And so these are the little baby steps that we're going to take into building these bridges together so that we can create a community of faith for the generations that are not only here that are not here yet and that are being born this day that are coming we want to be that community that welcomes them that reminds them there's always going to be a place at the table for them amen